So, John. Yeah? Did you hear about the marketer who had to raise awareness for their fencing company? No, what happened? They started by sponsoring posts. <laughs> You're listening to the Lion Share Marketing Podcast for marketing leaders by marketing leaders. Brought to you by Fidelitas.co. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 127 of the Lion Share Marketing Podcast. I am Tyler Sickmeyer from Fidelitas, joined by John the Wizard Merlin, also from Fidelitas. And uh, John, we have a super sweet episode coming up today. Erica Williams, the CEO and founder of Yummy Bear is going to be on the podcast, and I can guarantee you that her product is as tasty as the morsels of knowledge that she drops in the interview are. So make sure you stay tuned for that. But first, John, what's in the news? News team, assemble! So Adobe just released their data on the early holiday shopping and prices. And good news, uh, it's good news for marketers and consumers. Spending uh, has increased while prices have declined. So good news all around. Really exciting stuff. I'm sure many of you, like I, were were nervous with uh, talks of recession and everything like that. But the consumers went on a $72 billion online shopping spree in the month of October, an increase of around 11% on September and on par with October of last year, which despite inflation and talks of recessions, that's fantastic news. And this isn't, uh, you know, small fries. Adobe Analytics bases this off of 1 trillion visits to U.S. retail stores online, uh, 100 million SKUs. So this isn't a small sample size. So I think this is really encouraging stuff that uh, already we're, we're, we're seeing some uh, some progress or people are actually spending this year when I'm sure a lot of people were concerned that might not happen. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, John, this is uh it's rare that you and I disagree on this, subject, <laughs> but we're going to disagree. And as cool, you know, let's do it. from our, as you know, from our conversations internally at Fidelitas, I have been incredibly pessimistic, which is funny because I'm a fairly optimistic individual when it comes to life. Mm-hmm. So I feel like for our listeners that don't know me, I need to give context because uh, I feel like uh, right now, whenever I have these conversations, I'm more like chicken little and the sky is falling. But uh, I've been banging the we're in a recession drum since last December. Yeah. I'm not off that. It's, it's it's mind numbing to me that now people are like, well, we might go into a tiny recession next year. Are you kidding? Yeah. We might hit rock bottom next year if we're lucky. Every smart CEO that I'm talking to is is saying that we are at least – six to 12 months away from the bottom. Yeah. Not from recovery from the bottom. So what yeah, that says is I, it's going to get worse. Yeah. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Now, how does that tie into this article from Adobe? Let me explain the challenges brands have started, especially with the advent of the second prime day brands have started discounting earlier than ever before. So as marketing leaders shoot their discounting shots early, It concerns me that sales weren't up more than they were, John, because they've already started discounting so aggressively. And as you said, prices are down, great for consumers, spend is up. So we're spending more to acquire fewer uh, customers or at least the same number of customers at a lower AOV at the end of the day. So that concerns me. Number two, if you want to put on your chicken little hat and go even further down this rabbit hole with me, John, I think a lot of folks that are buying right now are folks that haven't adjusted their spending habits and haven't adjusted their lifestyles, even though on on paper they may make the same amount, but in effect with inflation, which, you know, if if, if they're saying inflation is 8 to 10 percent, I think that's muted. It's probably more like 12 to 14 percent. I saw uh, an infograph today that uh, said things like milk and eggs were up like 40 percent year over year. Airline tickets were up 40 percent year over year. You know, and that's not every spending category, but those are some staples right there that affect both Mm -hmm. businesses and consumers at the end of the day. When you look at business travel, when you look at uh, staples that every household is buying one way or the other, you're actually making 
ten percent ish less conservatively year over year, and that's not just that's, that's everybody right now because uh, frankly there are very few, if any, businesses giving raises during a recession, right? So your spends, your your as the average consumer, their pay is not going up, their their spend needed to maintain their lifestyle is going up, and they're not adjusting. So what happens? They tap into credit. And so what we're going to see is I think this credit bubble is going to pop, John. Uh, I don't think it'll pop in Q4, but I think it's going to pop in Q1. Uh, and I, I think we're headed towards the end of a cliff. I think it's going to be a very flat Christmas the rest of the way. I think we're going to have spend. I, I, I think people will spend close to what they have in years past. Uh, and it'll be sort of lackluster results. And you'll you'll hear mixed bags. You'll hear people that are optimistic saying, oh, it wasn't as bad as we thought. You know, the recession right. is over. What recession, right? And then you're going to have other folks that that think, okay, well, this is the calm before the storm, right? And I'm in yes. that camp. I think this is the calm before the storm. And it's almost like, I, I just picture like, like our entire industry and I, I picture uh, the entire US economy right now is like Wiley Coyote chasing the roadrunner. And like, we're on this yeah. very flat canyon right now and we're going to run out after. Yep. <laughs> and, and pretty soon we're going to realize that we're running on air and then we're going to have a real race to the bottom. So I think that's what's coming. Uh, and yeah. I, I think marketing leaders need to be uh, mindful of how they prepare for that uh, yeah. and, and take this data with a grain of salt because you are going to have to mm -hmm. discount to get sales. And I think part of it, it's indicative too. You can look at who's discounting what and by how much, John, and you can tell who's done the best job managing their inventory over the past year. Mm -hmm. Who has too much of what on hand and needs to get rid of it? And it'll be interesting to see if brands at large, John, get even more lenient with map pricing to let these retailers alleviate some of this backed up product, because otherwise they're not getting new product out on the shelves. And so I, I don't think we're going to have this cycle fixed. It started in spring when no one could get a shipping container out of the port of Long Beach, right? But here we are. And so, yeah. and so I don't think this is going to get fixed until next summer. And everyone that I'm talking to in e-commerce and in logistics and at the 3PL side seems to think the same thing. Like we're, it's going right. to be... Uh, May, June, July, August before uh, e-commerce and retail sort of catch up to themselves in terms of having the right product at the right time of year, which is so important. I mean, that's why you're seeing stuff marked down so aggressively. And frankly, most of the stuff that you're buying for Christmas, hopefully not the candy, but uh, everything else that you're buying for Christmas was probably on sale last year. And it's still here. Or it was meant to be on sale last year, but it arrived in March or it arrived right. in June. And so right. here we are, right? And and so we'll see how this really catches up to people. And it'll be interesting on the publicly traded side, uh, how some of these companies' books shake out when quarterly earnings come out in the first uh, first part of 2023. But I'm still very bearish for where we're at and where we're going. And we're advising clients accordingly at Fidelitas to make sure that you know exactly what your margins are. You know exactly what it takes to make money. And I'm telling people, be even more conservative when it comes to your lifetime value. Because I don't, I don't think you can bake on that. If your LTV yeah. was a hundred dollars a year in 2022 or 2021, guess what? It's probably not going to be a hundred dollars next year. Yeah. At some point, your customer is going to run out of room unless you're a staple. Yeah. So unless you're selling gasoline or you're selling milk or eggs or something else that people have to have and will continue to buy, if you're any sort of optional purchase, if you're apparel, if you're jewelry, if you're uh, electronics or accessories or anything else, you know, they might want the new video game or the new flat screen TV or the, the new watch or the new whatever. But if you haven't built that relationship, very few are actually going to put that on their credit card. That's probably close to max out by that point uh, and continue to go into more debt because at some point, like I said, everyone's going to realize that they're Wiley e. Coyote and they are off the canyon, so to speak. So we'll see what happens. Uh, I know it was a long, uh, long winded rant for me on where we're at and why. Uh, and I sort of teed you up when I sent you this article, but thanks for taking the bait. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, do you, do you agree or disagree with that? With, with, with where we're headed? Cause I, just, no, I, just, I, I agree with you. I, I, I agree with you. School's goal. I think we were, I think we were saying the same thing in different ways. Um, I think that this, this is exciting news that it wasn't worse, if that makes sense. <laughs> that's, like, that's, like, that's, like, that's like telling your dog, oh, you peed on yeah. the carpet, but at least you didn't poop on the carpet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I could, we could still spot treat this uh, Black Friday. <laughs> yeah, the, these numbers should come out with some stain remover. Yeah. That's... Yep. Yep. Yeah. Because, because uh, uh, you know, I'm expecting a shit show, so. <laughs> amen amen john good stuff as always let's get to our interview with erica
All right. I'm excited to be joined by Erica Williams, the founder at Yummy Candy. Yummy Candy is exactly what it sounds like. But Erica, besides that, tell us a little bit about uh, the brand and how you got started. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and, you know, share a little bit about my story. Uh, hopefully, you know, you guys listening will take some pieces away and help you in your business. But um, yeah, who doesn't love candy, right? <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty fun product, pretty nostalgic, you know, blast from the past. We all probably grew up, you know, in those five cent candies, you know, 10 cent candies. And really, it's about bringing the fun back to food um, as an adult, but also creating healthy alternatives that everyone can just enjoy and feel good about eating. Um, you know, I come from an extensive background and we can kind of talk about that too, but the company's really founded on, you know, bringing fun to candy, but also creating healthy alternatives. So what does that mean? Our product is three grams of sugar. Um, we don't have any artificial sweeteners or sugar alcohols that are found in a lot of these healthy alternative products. Um, and we also are plant-based meaning vegan. So just a great candy that's, you know, for a widespread of, you know, really anyone can enjoy it. People love to give it to their kids. I know diabetics that religiously use it because it is low sugar, um, athletes, you know, adventure junkies, really anyone. So, we can kind of go back into like why I started the company and, you know, sure. what's, what's kind of brought me here. Um, just because I think that, you know, as a founder, when you're creating a product, it's important to come from a need so that you know that there's demand there. Like what need are you fulfilling or what service are you providing and how does that help people? And I think that's Absolutely. what it comes back down to, you know, just creating any type of product. So um, my background's all in the health field. Um, I did kinesiology as my undergrad at UFV. And at the time I was a personal trainer. I was also an online trainer and I was working for a sports nutrition company. So I really had my whole focus set around optimizing health, optimizing performance. Um, how do we live healthier lifestyles and teaching people how to do the same and, you know, those healthy habits that, you know, play into that. So my focus is always around nutrition. Um, I really, I, I have a huge sweet tooth, unfortunately. I laugh because, you know, I'm such a fitness Same. junkie. But, you know, I have the biggest sweet tooth. So it's always this battle of, you know, I, I want my cake and I want to eat it too. And how can we fit those both worlds into one? And I truly believe in integrating, you know, that whole concept of, you know, loving what you're eating and appreciating the food. Um, but also staying on your healthy lifestyle goals and plans. And that might look different for everyone. I, I coached a variety of people anywhere from, you know, moms that, you know, just had a baby, wanted to kind of get back to a healthy routine or advanced athletes that were in the bodybuilding world or, you know, um, going for their first competition. So um, I have myself competed as well. So I, I know both spectrums. I know the, you know, the just trying to get yourself in a healthy position, but I also know the spectrum of hardcore, you know, dieting, really, you know, getting your body to crazy levels, um, which are not always the healthiest, which I'll always be full transparent about that as well. But um, so it really stemmed from this place of I wanted a product like this. I wanted a product that, you know, I could feel good about eating. It didn't take me off my, you know, healthy lifestyle plan or what I was doing 80% of my time, which means, you know, eating, you know, uh, great whole foods, um, nourishing my body, going to the gym, staying active, doing all those healthy principles. But how could I have something that fixes my sweet tooth? You know, I, I love chocolate. I love candy. But it gets to a point where I'm like, oh, this just doesn't align with my nutrition goals anymore. It just, you know, I can fit it in once a week, but it's definitely not something I'm having, you know, every single day. So for me, it was really important to have a low sugar product because, you know, my extensive past in nutrition, you know, obesity is on the rise. Um, heart, heart disease, strokes are on the rise. Um, di diabetes is on the rise in Canada and the U S and, you know, most, you know, most parts of the world. So this is a, an epidemic and it's about creating solutions for people to have accessible to them so that they can make these decisions, you know, with what they're eating, with what they're choosing to put in their body. And I think people are ready for it because really what I've noticed in the past two, three years, people are getting very aware and conscious of what they're putting into their body. And it's these little changes that we make that can really, um, you know, basically accumulate to a huge difference in not only your life, sure. but you know, at the world at large and the types of products that we're producing. So 
Um, that's kind of the four, core foundation is I, I always just like to recommend to people, like, what is your inspiration behind the product? For me, I was a perfect consumer. I was already looking for a product like this. I wanted something. I knew, you know, the trends that were happening in the fitness industry because I worked in the sports supplement field. I was flying all around to different trade shows. I was talking to people. I was tasting products. I was, you know, really getting that consumer feedback one-on-one. And I was like, you know, why, why isn't anyone doing this? There's not competition in this space. Candy hasn't been innovated on in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, most of the, you know, um, chocolate bars and candy you probably had as a kid, you can still find in store. So really it hasn't been innovated a whole lot. So how can we come in and be a mover, a shaker and innovate in this space um, and also be, you know, first, second, third to market because there's not a lot of competition as well. So that was kind of where I started putting together, you know, from my business side of, wow, this is really a great you know, a great product. And then from more my, you know, nutrition standpoint is there's a real need here. So first things first is you always need demand (laughs) for your product, you know? So let's dive into that for a second, Erica. Talk about quantifying demand. Because obviously like you knew what you wanted as a customer, which is always a great place to start as a founder, but talk about quantifying that beyond yourself and how you got to a point where you're like, okay, we've got something that can scale here. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that is very important. And, you know, when I talk to other founders and talk to other um, companies, I'm, I'm always interested of how they, their process to kind of quantify it or what they're doing to kind of get that insight and confirmation. Um, so there, there are a couple of things. I mean, this, this idea was really started in, I want to say 2015, 2016. We didn't start R&D till late 2018, 2019. So I had kind of kept the ball going with my career. And, um, you know, I think we we hit at the right point because, you know, there's still not a lot of competition. But um, what I was seeing over those years was I was getting that one-on-one direct feedback um, from not only my clients, but people I saw at different trade shows. I was getting industry feedback. So, you know, retailers were talking to me. I was a personal sales rep for stores for retailers. So I was always in the know of what were they getting in store? What was selling well in their store? Um, so I was, I was able to have that insight of, Hey, you know, the candy space, you know, it needs to be innovated. There's a lot of people that are looking for healthier alternatives in the candy market. Um, so I was, you know, obviously taking notes on all of those things, but it really was in our, you know, beta testing where we had an actual product. We were starting to go through, you know, the process of creating a winning product. And that's something that I always like to talk about as well is how do you know you have a winning product for us? We wanted unparalleled taste. So we wanted to, you know, not only, you know, be a contender to traditional candy. Cause what I found was a lot of people, you know, feedback from people and myself being a huge candy lover is yeah, there's healthy alternatives out there, but you know, you're kind of sacrificing the taste and you're paying extra for it. So there's kind of this negative connotation about all these healthy alternatives out there. Whereas my spin is what if we made the taste even better than traditional candy? So they didn't even have to feel like they, not only did they not sacrifice, but they actually just gravitated to the taste more than the full sugar alternative. So that was through um, beta testing. So we did a lot of product testings. We did surveys with people, blind tests. So they would just go out, you know, try our product, try other products, give their feedback. We would take that in. We would review it. We would, you know, and it it was two years of this. We did R&D for two years. So it definitely was for our product specifically, very heavy on the upfront of creating the winning product. But then when you go to market, it's like, you know, your selling points. Um, so taste was huge for us. Texture was another thing. We wanted to make sure it wasn't hard. It didn't get stuck in your teeth. That was a lot of the negative, you know, feedback coming sure. from what was on the market is, you know, yeah. it's, it's just too hard. I can't give it to my kids. It gets stuck in my teeth. Um, quality ingredients was another one. We wanted to make sure we weren't sacrificing. If people are paying more for a healthy alternative, you're putting in only the best ingredients and then having the healthy call outs. So, you know, having three grams of sugar per bag, having the no sugar alcohols, no artificial sweeteners, um, gluten-free, non-GMO, all of those things, keeping it affordable so that, you know, it's accessible to everyone. Um, and then that's where the demand comes in of like, okay, now I have a winning product. It hits this, 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 this. Um, I'm hitting all the major points that I'm trying to hit. Now we can go to market. So we are very heavy on the upfront portion. And, you know, another reason is, um, you know, one of the health yes fact was vegan, right? A lot of canning companies, they either have vegan alternatives or they're, um, they have a couple SKUs that might have 
not like gelatin. They don't have gelatin in their products. So we want to make sure we are totally vegan because um, I do know that it's a wave, even if I call it like, you know, the plant-based spectrum, you know, some people are just looking for those alternatives. And if there is a plant-based option out there, they're more apt to go towards that than a non-vegan product. So yeah, that's what I can say to people is, is just really know your product inside and out, do these, you know, get feedback. Feedback is the best way for you to have success, Absolutely. right? So let's you geek know? out for a second, Erica, what tools are you using to get that feedback? Um, in, do you mean in terms of like software or? Yeah. Or, yeah. Like what, what, so like, what is, what is your, so like for a marketing or listening in, they're like, man, like that sounds awesome. Really smart way to build out. Right. And even for an existing brand that's trying to figure out product development, right. As they, as they expand their lines or add new SKUs or whatever they're trying to do, mm-hmm. uh, talk about what mechanisms you use and, and, and how you went about actually getting that feedback. Yeah, yeah. No, my team creates um, surveys. So we've done type form surveys. Um, There's other, there's there's tons of different survey platforms. Um, Really, I wouldn't get caught up on which one to use rather that you put these benchmarks in, you do the actual testing because it's just logistics, right? And at the end of the day, we're all pulled in 5 million different directions. So um, it can, it can get hard to be like, oh, do we really got to do this? Is this step important? But Um, you know, I, I do believe how you do one thing is how you do everything. So to put these blocks in, to get that feedback, we do in-person test groups. So we'll just have blind testing and it might be a sample group of 20, 25. That could be anyone from people on the team or influencers or just family and friends, you know, other consumers we've met, you know, we invite people to those test groups, or it might be something where we send out boxes to a whole list of influencers that we have, send them a survey online and all they have to do is give their feedback Um, And then that's just real genuine um, feedback. And then I've also actually just gone walking around town, walking downtown Vancouver, giving people the product and getting their reaction, really just like grassroots style. Um, And that's always great and valuable as well, because, you know, a lot of people will say something on a survey that's online, but, you know, to really get them in person and put them on the spot, it's not done too often nowadays. So that's, that's probably my favorite one. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It's great, great, great to get that feedback in the moment. And uh, let's talk for a second. And again, as you alluded to, Erica, you guys got your start in Canada. You've, you're mm-hmm. breaking into the U.S. right now. Talk about the differences in your marketing approach between growing the brand from scratch in Canada and now taking the ne- next steps and trying to grow that brand here in the United States. Yeah, yeah. So two very different markets, although, you know, Canada's not too far away from the U.S. It's it's a much smaller market, I would say. The U.S. is massive. I mean, just just California alone is the population of Canada, really. So, you know, the scalability in the U.S. is astronomical compared to Canada. However, um, you know, it's 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 for me, it's almost like a beta test for the U.S. market. You know, if you're growing and successful in Canada, you know, just wait till you get to the U.S. market because it's it's so much bigger. Um, but then there's more competition too. So you have to be stronger in your your key points of your winning product to understand, you know, how is this market different potentially? How are we going to tackle it differently? Where are we going to start with our, our plan? Um, you know, what's our target audience? So we really, you know, our, our product, as I said, is for a wide range of people, but we do target more, um, you know, families, families that have kids, because I find they're the trend, you know, it's, it's usually when you have your, your, your first kids, you're like, okay, we got to, you know, what's healthier for them. And in turn, the parents start to see what's healthier for, for, um, you know, mom and dad as well. So I think it's about, um, knowing your audience, speaking to them online. And then how does that change in Canada? Well, Canada, we we actually had a very strong physical presence because we had a big community, a big team. So if you look on our social media, we did a ton of in-person events. Um, even when it was hard to, we were doing online ones, we were doing um, demos, so we were doing product tastings. And those things were key for us growing in Canada. So with our product specifically, because it's mostly driven on taste, it's kind of hard because you can, you know, market healthy candy all day long. And that's very, you know, catchy to people. But once people taste it, it's like game over. They are a product, you know, yummy candy lover for life, which is great. So our, our main focus was how do we get in front of those people? How do we get them tasting our product and where do we send them to? That was our, our main questions to start. So in the consumer product, you know, um, kind of industry and world, we're used to doing a lot of demos. Well, those were unfortunately shut down for a while. So we couldn't do in-store demos. We couldn't do product tastings. Um, So for a while, we went to different markets that were open. 
or, you know, we just held off for a while, but what happened was we, we found different routes. I'm, I've door knocked in my past. I've, you know, been a salesperson my, my whole life selling other people's products and now mine. Um, so we actually had a team go out we were selling candy door to door. We were leaving coupons on, you know, cars so that they could check out online, check us out. We were running, um, social campaigns. So ads across Canada, we were also supporting our retailers with different, um, you know, in-store programs. So, you know, Hey, buy two bags, get X percent off or something like that. Um, so we, we really have done almost any type of marketing that you could think of in Canada. We even wrapped vehicles. So at one point we had a whole fleet of yummy candy vehicles going around Canada. Um, and that was just more on brand awareness. Um, so we, we, we had to tackle a lot of different things was there's a bit of education with our product, um, just, you know, reasons why it's better than traditional candy, which is pretty straightforward, but you still have a little explaining to do right. Um, and then getting it into people's hands. So those were kind of the strategies we used to, you know, do that. And I'll say to date, still in-person events, product tasting is our number one of how we get a true fan because they really, you know, not only do they love the packaging and the branding and the team and the community, but they really fall in love with the product. Hey, this is something that I would actually use in my day-to-day life. Like I'm going to go home, I'm going to be snacking later tonight and I'm going to, you know, grab my yummy candy instead of the whatever else they usually grab. Um, so though that has been very successful for us in Canada and we have a strong team in Canada. So now our challenge, you know, with the U S market is how the heck do you cover the U S <laughs> you know, how do you yeah. create all these teams across the U S and have product sampling. And, um, this was actually something I was in charge of that when we had prior companies I worked for. So I already had, you know, kind of a game plan, a, an idea in my head. Um, and we are focusing in, in West coast, you know, and kind of East Coast, it's similar to Canada, how, you know, West Coast, Vancouver, Toronto, you know, they're more of the plant, plant-based plant forward type of demographic. They're looking for these healthier alternatives. Um, so that's kind of where we're, we're we don't want to bite off too much than we can chew. We, we're obviously, you know, um, expanding nationally in the U.S., but we're also focusing on West Coast. Um, and then that's something that our team has access to. We're doing events, you know, so we can fly the team down. We can go to those events. We can do the in-product tasting. We just did, um, we were in San Diego in September, and then we did the Philly show as well. So, you know, just getting into that community, really plugging in and getting people to try our product. Um, and then in terms of, I mean, we've already been in talks with uh, a lot of different large retailers, but marketing wise, it's going to be similar of supporting the stores, doing those geo-targeted ads, creating communities in, you know, those little hot spots, um, and really just, you know, scaling from there, starting in one kind of condensed area, getting really good at that and then building it out. And that's kind of what we did in Canada. We started West coast and we built out East and then, you know, expanded all the way across Canada and now have full presence. So it's kind of, we're at the brand awareness, you know, phase with the U S of, you know, just getting, you know, just getting people aware of our product. And that's really the first step is you can do so much with organic or original marketing, just in that phase of really building, you know, your story, your brand online, your presence, you know, building your following. It depends on what type of product you have, obviously ours, you know, is major in retail. So we're, we're sold mostly in, um, you know, grocery stores, natural channel, a convenience channel, just different ways, you know, that are actual physical brick and mortar businesses, but we also sell online too. But I know, you know, other founders that, you know, take this model and they just scale online with a physical product as well. So there's a lot of different avenues we can, we can go with it, but um, yeah, our, our strategies are brand awareness, educate, retarget, scale. And last step would really just be omnipresent. So then you just really hit it home and, you know, make sure you're everywhere that people look. So if they're thinking of healthy candy, they're thinking of yummy candy. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I love that and uh, totally uh, get where you're coming from. And I, I like that approach too, to start with the trend setting regions traditionally, which is West Coast, East Coast, and then trends tend to come in. One thing, it's it's interesting. We just had this conversation uh, recently, I believe on the, on the I believe it was on the podcast. Uh, maybe our loyal listeners remember better than me, but uh, we were talking about how since social media has gotten so popular and so ingrained in people's way of life trends don't it, it used to be you could you could run a joke and i can say this because i'm from the midwest originally but you could say that the midwest is three to five years behind the coast and now it's more like three to five hours behind the coast right because yeah. as soon as things are established out here it's on tiktok it's on instagram it, it it's it, it it starts to trend and now all of a sudden it gets picked up everywhere as a result of that so 
Yeah, I think no, it's, I it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. Yeah. So yeah, and I would say even just education, like people are really yeah. finding a lot of you know different information. Like I I think about even five ten years ago, the conversations that I had with my clients, you know, health clients online were, were pretty basic you know, about, you know, what to eat, what to put in their body, what to fuel yourself. But now a lot, I generally, I mean, I do surround myself within the health and fitness community, but generally most people have a great understanding of nutrition, what, you know, what they should be eating, you know, types of products to fuel their bodies. So I also see that social media with, you know, you get it. I mean, everyone here knows they get the reels pushed at them and, you know, five things to eat to get to slim your waistline or this or that. So generally, I find that's also helped people just evolve their eating patterns as well, which obviously helps us because it's less education for us to do. And, you know, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be stuck with category education. You just want to have brand and product education and win share of market in your category. When you guys do the heavy lifting for the category, which we're actually helping a couple other brands do at Fidelitas right now, like you just have to Mm -hmm. set expectations. And that's one thing we talk about all the time with these clients is, hey, like you got to remember you've got to convert people to the category first and then we have to win them over to your brand. So it's like, Mm -hmm. it's an extra step process because they're so early to the game. And I think that's why a lot of times you see these early adapters come in and they, they're not the ones that win in the long run. It's usually the person that comes in one or two steps behind them and drafts on their early success in educating the market. And they have a slightly more cost efficient, better, cheaper, faster, whatever option. And they win a lot of times, right? Because they're not Mm -hmm. doing the the heavy lifting of category education up front. And that frees up those startup dollars to go to uh, customer acquisition versus category uh, development first. So it's, it's an interesting uh, challenge. And thankfully, you you know, you're not the only brand in the space, which helps, right? Because, because there are some other brands sharing that burden for you. And, And like you said, even just the trends in general with, people wanting to eat healthier, paying more attention to what they put in their kids' lunchboxes, et cetera. There's just a lot more, there's, there's a lot more attention being given to this category. So I think you're, you're definitely in the right place and right time. Um, I would agree. I mean, I I think the candy industry is a billion dollar business. You know, people are buying full sugar products that are not good for their health, you know, 24 seven. And I'm, I'm always shocked when I go into, you know, grocery store and I see how many chocolate bars are on the shelves and how many gummies and how many hard candies. And, you know, it's like Willy Wonka, like whatever you could imagine is there. And, you know, th- those products all have demand from it. So even though there's a couple players in this category, I really come from the thought of abundance. Like there's more than enough, you know, people out there buying candy products for all of us to serve, you know, to do really well in the market space. Um, And I just take that as an opportunity to focus on my business, focus on my product, make it the best that I can possibly make it. And at the end of the day, people are going to decide, you know, there, I tell people do the taste test, you know, take several other brands, take full sugar product, compare it to this, you know, to yummy bear to yummy soda. And, you know, I, I love people's feedback because I think when you're, when you do create a winning product and you're confident in, you know, like the things I said, their taste, your texture, your quality, you know, all your major call outs you know, it's really up for people to decide. And that's the best exciting part, because I always say, you know, hey, if you like product X, you'll love ours. If you don't like product X, you'll love ours. You know, it's kind of a win win either way you look at it. Um, But yeah, it definitely does help with overall just the category um, becoming more popular, healthy candy. I think people 20 or even five years ago, people don't even really think that was a thing like healthy candy. What? What? How how can candy be healthy? That's like an oxy you know, more on our, however you call it, but, um, or paradox. So I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's one of those things where those companies definitely help, but I always like to stay in my lane and just focus on making yummy candy the best that I can be. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so we're recording this in early November, Erica, let's talk about how yeah. Halloween went this year. So you're, you, you're on the, uh, tail end of your Super Bowl. So yeah. in, in the candy <laughs> industry, how, how, how did it go for you guys? Really good. So yeah, when we do get campaigns, we always obviously focus them around traditional high candy purchasing um, holidays. So Halloween's huge, Easter, um, uh, December with Christmas, New Year's. But we also do really well in, um, you know, New Year's when people are trying to get off of their, you know, sugar fixes where they've overindulged. You know, it's a classic cycle. And I saw this as a as a coach and a competitor, right? People usually indulge around the winter months, you know, have their treats and stuff. And then, oh, 
January's here. Like, let's get back to healthy alternatives. Let's, you know, look. So we're huge in January. We're huge in um, Veganuary is kind of like the staple month too for plant-based products. Yeah. Um, so again, we do, you know, we did really well with Halloween this year. We did a um, campaign all around our snack sizes. So they're a 20 gram bag instead of our traditional 50 gram bag. And we did um, an online sale campaign. So we were pushing that. We had influencers post about it, um, did really well. And then in store, we also did other, um, you know, activities with retailers to say like, you know, buy two for X amount or you get a certain percentage off. Um, so yeah, Halloween was great. Um, but, you know, really we're at the point with, <laughs> with marketing and everything. It's like every month we have something. It's like, okay, we're already gearing up for Black Friday. And then we're gearing up for, you know, the holidays, which is about two weeks and then New Year's. And then, oh, January is our biggest year. And then February is Valentine's. It's another, you know, Hall- or yep. uh, another treat holiday. So pretty much every month for us, we have a huge sale campaign going on, which is great, great. but obviously creates a hectic schedule. <laughs> yep, that's great. That's great. So how, how big is your marketing team right now? Talk, talk to us about what who, uh, well, how, how you've built out your team because you guys are still very much a challenger brand and growing and uh, yeah. talk about what your team looks like currently. Yeah, so our team, um, really when I was when I was working with other companies, I, I am an entrepreneur, right? So I'm always, you know, taking notes and being a sponge and really understanding, you know, what can help a company scale. And I really saw, you know, I worked for the largest uh, sports nutrition company in Canada. And it, it was still like, even though they did, you know, tens of millions per year, it was still a tight knit, you know, group. And if you have one very pro um, productive teammate, it can carry you know, a three person team and they're all working at 30%. Right. So I really value, you know, people and their quality over, you know, just building out a team and having a bunch of people doing different things. We all, you know, wear a lot of hats and, you know, me right now, I'm wearing a a ton of hats as well. So we have a close knit team. Um, We probably have six people within, you know, the marketing team. And I mean, that's good. If, if, If anything, I think that's more than enough, especially for a brand, you know, emerging in a different market. Like my, my advice to other founders, especially like during the startup phase of really, you know, scaling, you're, you're going to do most of it yourself. Maybe not, you know, taking the photos and, you know, content production, but in terms of, you know, the, the idea of the marketing campaign, setting that up. And so you, you need a couple key people to obviously outsource and do those activities that maybe you're not an expert in, or, um, you know, that just take up too much time and you need to focus on, you know, the, the things that push your needle and, and move your business forward. Um, so I am a promote proponent of that, but it is a balancing scale. You know, you have too many hands in the pot. Sometimes it creates confusion. Sometimes there's miscommunication, um, you know, under, under performance. And then other people feel like they're carrying more of the weight. So, you know, it's really a process as, you know, um, you know, business owners to understand, you know, is the team working effectively? And that can, I always relate, you know, to sports as well. It seems like I always relate business to sports, but it's the same thing. Is a team working together for the same goal? Are we all moving in the same direction? Are we passing the ball or are we kind of hogging the ball so that I can get to the finish line and, you know, be the one to score the goal, right? So um, I think it's just auditing that on, like, you know, a monthly basis, keeping communication with your teammates, um, which is more difficult. We were, you know, we we're all kind of spread out for the last two years. So we didn't always have the typical office environment, nine to five. Hey, we're in here where, you know, we can just go pop into each other's office. So there were definitely challenges um, with that, but also a lot of um, pros as well. And just having, you know, great people on the team and, and creating, you know, great content, great stuff for, for social media. And I have a lot of support around me too, which I'm super thankful of. You know, I have friends and family and they'll come out and do a shoot, you know, last second I'll call them up and say, Hey, you know, three people cancel. Can you bring your kids? And they're right there and they're, they're wanting to support me and everything. So I am super, super thankful for that too. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you're facing on the marketing side right now as you uh, continue to scale into the U S yeah, I think with marketing, it's, it's like a, sometimes like a sinkhole, you know what I mean? And I think other, you know, company founders or people that have done a lot of marketing in business can find that as well, whether you have, you know, a service or a product, um, marketing can take up a lot of dollars and you want to always be very cautious of what the ROI is that you're getting back. I mean, we get reached out to daily, you know, there's, you know, 
five to 10 emails a day of people wanting to market, to provide services, to put our product in their, you know, subscription box or anything like that. So there's a lot of avenues that are kind of put to you. And especially when you go to trade shows, I mean, I don't know if you've ever looked at the stack of cards that you get for, you know, people you want to contact versus people that want to contact you. Like (laughs) there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, have a lot of, and, and I'm not saying, you know, um, don't spend money on marketing. Obviously, that's a huge part of it. But I, I do feel for, you know, the startups where they're really just trying to get their their foot out there and they think that, oh, I have to do this product or service in order to launch my brand. A lot of it, a lot of it is bootstraps, you know, from the beginning and then scaling up into that. And so, um, you know, what I think we're facing is I have to be very careful on our ROI and choosing which products we go to, choosing which services we align with, because, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's numerous out there and you can be doing five different market marketing campaigns at one time. So which one's going to work best for your business? What is the goal of that marketing campaign or that service? Um, is it what you're truly focusing on for the business or is that, you know, a six months out to 12 months out kind of campaign? So we're constantly getting these, you know, people reaching out and we're betting all, you know, all options, all, you know, ROIs. And then what we do is we kind of put it on a, a timeline. So, you know, okay, this is a, in three months, we'll reach back out, or this is a six months reach out. This is a 12 months, you know, as we scale, we're able to do more, but we want to do more with those partnerships that are, are obviously, you know, creating a win, win, win solution. So, you know, the customer is winning, they get an awesome product at a great price, you know, their service is winning because they're providing a great service to us. And we're winning as a company because we're scaling and, and moving more products. So I would just say that there is a lot that you can do, you know, just yourself, just with your team alone. And then if you're in the second phase of, okay, how do we scale? That's when you start to look at, you know, some of these types of marketing services. So that's where we're really at is, Hey, how are we scaling? You know, what, what KPIs are we measuring? Are they being, you know, used at the the best possible way? Um, and just, yeah, drilling down on that. Absolutely. And that's smart. Everything has to be ROI focused, right? And that's yeah. where, not to turn this into an infomercial for Fidelitas, but that's really where we thrive is we dial everything, even softer services like PR and SEO back to a tangible, okay, but how much money did you really make? Uh, and I think that's so critical for marketing there's to look at. And you can't even look at these artificial top line numbers like ROAS, you've got to really dial in and understand, no, but what did you net? Because if you gave the product away to get the ROAS, you still didn't make anything. And you have to be aware of your cogs and everything else. And I think too many marketing leaders get stuck on the artificial numbers and they're running stuff like, oh, we we get a 4X ROAS on this channel and we do this and this. And it's like, okay, but how much did you really make? Right. And And I think so many times people get Caught, caught in the wrong thing. So I, I agree with that approach entirely. And Erica, this has been awesome. We've loved having you on. Uh, as you probably know, uh, one question we ask all of our uh, s- smart guests before we let them go is for one key takeaway. So if you had to leave our listen, our marketing leaders listening in today with one key takeaway, what would that be? Um, it would probably be just get started. Do the thing that you know you're putting off first. <laughs> the biggest thing as, you know, owning a company or, you know, being your, being an entrepreneur or anything. And that it's just, we put out these little things and if you just get started and you take one small action, it literally snowballs. Um, and I have to remind myself that too, cause you get a little bit stuck with oh, all the day to day, you know, stuff that's going on. Um, so yeah, take action, do that one thing that you're avoiding and go from there. Yeah. 100%. Awesome. Erica, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. The website is yummybear.com. Yummybear.com. Yep. Yummy Candy Co. on Instagram. And you can find me LinkedIn, Eric Williams, or my Instagram is Yummy Candy Founder. Awesome. Yep. Go uh, go, go. check them out. Get yourself some. Uh, I can tell you firsthand. So Erica and I met at a uh, trade show in Philly and I've had the candy and it is indeed yummy. So uh, they are authentic and honest in their brand approach. So go check them out. Erica, thanks again for coming on the show. Perfect. Thanks, Tyler. Thank Thank you so much. All right. That wraps up episode 127 of the Lion Share Marketing Podcast. Thanks again to Erica for coming on. Always fun to dive into uh, Halloween numbers and get behind the scenes on how candy companies are operating and they really are a best in class operation. So if you haven't had a chance to try Yummy Bear yet, make sure that you go do that. Uh, you know, for, for someone that is a fat kid at heart, take it sincerely from me that uh, it's really good. 
and uh, don't buy it in bulk because you will eat the book. That's unless you have people to share it with. That's my advice on that side. But thanks again to Erica for coming on. We appreciate her. And thanks to all of you loyal listeners for subscribing and sharing. Remember, sharing is caring. So if you haven't shared this podcast with a friend, why not? Now's a better time to do it. So stop what you're doing. Stop walking, stop jogging, stop driving, pull over to the side of the road, stop scrolling aimlessly, get open up your podcast app, open up YouTube, whatever it is you're listening to this on, and hit the share button and share it with somebody. So that's all we ask. And if you haven't left us a review, we'd love that too, as long as it is five stars or better. So thanks again for listening. And until next time, cheers. You've been listening to the Lionshare Marketing Podcast, brought to you by Fidelitas.co. Get measurable results from a strategic partner because winners keep score.